Welcome back to the stream. Welcome back to the recordings. Welcome back wherever you are. Today we're going back into the eye tracker project. So this will be a continuation from a project that I've only streamed once before, actually. This was from April 26th. This was tearing down a, an eye tracker, so a peripheral that's looking for where your pupils are pointed, and sometimes where your head's located. And we were tearing down a product made by a company called Toby, called the iX, and it turns out that it's put together a lot like uh, a lot like some other USB 3 camera based peripherals like the Leap Motion where it has a, hard, a piece of hardware which is effectively a fairly customized webcam plus lighting setup and then all of the actual tracking is done in software and we spent some time poking into the... Uh, to the bleh. we spent some time taking apart both the software and the hardware in that tracker but in this stream, we're actually going to try taking a look at a, uh, a sister product to that one. So the one we looked at before was called the Toby iX, and this one is the Toby iTracker 4C. And from what I understand, I think this one actually uses a hardware tracking engine and doesn't require USB 3, so we should actually see something potentially pretty different. And my plan here is to take the footage from both of these and make a video that's sort of a tear down of both and a comparison of how they each do things. But most importantly, we've got this cat here. Something is buzzing. Oh, the tripod I had up here for VR was vibrating. The cat usually buzzes at a different frequency. I'm used to the cat's purrs, but this was the, the tripod leg vibrating against the, the server. I could take this down. I don't need it up there right now, and it's not calibrated anymore. Tuco, are you calibrated? Tuco, you're always calibrated. Okay. Oh, and uh, in case you hadn't heard the good news, things are actually going pretty well on the other product or projects right now. So I've been trying to get this cat robot camera going. And I've actually got a pretty nice uh, prototype of the winch bot here. Oh, so let's get this recording. So that is the the iX Toby camera that we took apart last time. The Toby iX. Hey, Tuco. You are a buzzy little fumblin. Fumble, fumble cat. What is the cutest nonsense word my brain could come up with in that millisecond? to go. All right, so uh, you can see here the half disassembled carcass of the iX that we took apart in the last stream still. That chip in the middle is a, I believe that's the USB 3 microcontroller, the Cypress uh, FX3 series something or other. And that's some SPI flash, which I think has the firmware for that. We didn't look amazingly closely, but it looks like it's basically USB 3 microcontroller system on chip over here, imaging system on chip, power supply slash drivers for the, the LED emitters over here, and then some more kind of local switching power supply. And then over here is actually an interesting feature that we found where it looks like that's an optional connector where depending on how you populate the board, you can actually send the USB 3 super speed signal up to a flat flex connector instead of out to the really strange USB super speed mini B connector, which I've never seen before. 
So I was hypothesizing that perhaps that was how they implemented these self-contained devices, was by using this same circuit board perhaps, and then maybe a backing circuit board that had some kind of embedded thing with more processing power that could actually implement their algorithms. But I doubt that's what they're doing for the 4C. Maybe that's what the earlier models did. But this one is actually smaller than the, at least the outer box is smaller. So I, I would expect to see something pretty simple inside. Anyway, so that's doing all right. Um, yeah, so the cat camera is also going really well. I, I've reached a bit of a stopping point in the, the filming of the project, so I was like kind of collecting some footage to start editing that together. But I'm also going to keep working on that, so I've been, I think the next step there has been trying to design the actual robot part that holds the camera. So this is for a project that, um, oh man, my topic line, I just noticed is completely out of date. That's what I was working on before. Um, yeah, so that, that project was a robot that flies around on wires, not on quadcopter motors, and um, did I, do I have any old topic lines I can pilfer? So, which one's this called again? The 4C. Something like that. We can we can elaborate later if we care. I, I don't really need to set it up elaborately right this moment. Um, yeah. So anyway, the I was just giving a brief update for anyone who cares about other product projects that I've been streaming which isn't really relevant to the current topic anyway, but the, the cat-related camera has plenty of things going on. I'm currently trying to see if I can simplify it, actually. I had been planning on including a depth camera on the robot, partially because it would be fun for collecting data, but mostly for avoiding obstacles. And now I've been thinking that that's just, it's been a big design constraint in terms of both weight and uh, data processing. And I think I can get all the functionality I need in terms of obstacle avoidance from just a ring of infrared distance sensors, the, the kind that you can, well, normally they're like $15, which was a lot when you had, need like eight of them, but I think, uh, I think I found a cheap pile of them that'll do all right for that sensor. So I was ex going to explore that possibility. So that might end up simplifying the robot itself a lot. And I wouldn't need a Raspberry Pi on that. I would just have some microcontroller, which I need the microcontroller anyway. The Raspberry Pi can't handle the timing constraints on some of the stuff I need that to do. So having a microcontroller that directly has an ethernet interface on there might be nice. So I could use the same microcontroller I'm using for the winch bots. So anyway, that's, that's a CAD in progress. Whoa, is my grabber died again? Oh, good question from Ken. Have I considered a rotating LiDAR? Yeah, I have. Um, in fact, I have, a, I have a rotating LiDAR that I picked up when it was, you know, it seemed inexpensive a while ago. So um, it's like from a, a type of robotic vacuum cleaner that used to be popular. Or maybe it wasn't ever popular, but the sensors went on surplus <laughs> so you could find them. Um, why do I not a video? Um, but yeah, I've been thinking about trying that. One concern I have is that the, I mean, the data for that's gonna be really weird because I'm going to be on this moving platform that is going to be kind of cutting this plane through this relatively cubicle thing with lots of windows and curtains and stuff. And so, yeah, the Neato Robotics, that's what I was talking about. Um, yeah, so I've, I've got one of those sensors. I haven't actually played with it much. I was thinking about experimenting with it to see if it would be worth putting one of those on the Tuco Flyer robot. Although I don't really imagine it, its data being that useful. Although, I don't know, I mean, it's certainly worth considering. I honestly hadn't even gotten to the point where that data would be useful. That data might be useful for like XY positioning, but for that, I might get better results from something like the, the lighthouse sen uh, sensors and transponders from, from the, from the HTC Five, 
Um, at this point, I'm mostly just interested in the control system that lets me keep it stable and fly it around, which uh, I don't even need to know where it is in the room. I mostly just need to know what the status of all the winches are. And, um, you know, like a distance from the ceiling might be useful, a distance from the floor, although I think there might be more obstructions on the floor. Hey, Tuco. But yeah, I mean, let's uh, let's play with those sensors maybe. That could be useful to have. Um, especially if I can put it somewhere. Putting, Giving it an unobstructed view is tough. I would have to obstruct its view just a little bit probably to, to provide supports for the gimbal. But I could potentially put a sensor kind of in between the, the mount. You know, the actual wires would come in and then there'd be a stock and then the gimbal at the end. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm like air wiring the drawing that I was about to switch inputs and actually show you. Hey Tuco, do you want to play right this moment? This is a really, really rough CAD model. It is not to scale or painted or anything. Uh, let's turn this off. I mean, actually, it is to scale. That's the one thing I lied about. Being to scale is actually really useful, but it isn't. And it is painted. I put some materials on it. So I'm just, I'm just lying about everything. But it, it is not remotely complete, is what I should say. Um, so this is a model I made of the mounting plate for the gimbal. This is a really rough bounding volume, kind of estimating how much space the gimbal needs. And so this is the, the gimbal's yaw axis, or at least my best estimate of it. So like when the camera is panning left and right, that's uh, the axis it's rotating around. So, and then, um, I haven't actually modeled it yet, but my idea would be that the the wires from the winches, or you know nylon ropes in this case, would come in at an angle, you know, between horizontal and fairly vertical, depending on how up and down the the robot wants to be. And I would set that to to come in at some distance from the very center axis, where that distance would determine kind of how much orienting force I get, but also how much kind of unwanted orienting force I get. So I, I might have kind of a thin uh, disc here that the, the wires attach to. But anyway, the idea is to have the wires and the cable harness up here, up here above this plane. And then sensors here, which would determine if this is getting close to bumping into something. And so I want this to be applicable if you're driving around the gimbal with it pointed. You know, the, I'm never going to really be aiming the gimbal up, I think. It'll be at most level. So you could be driving it forward, and you'd want to make sure you aren't about to bump into a person or furniture or whatever. Or maybe you're about to go lower, and so then I could look down and see how much distance we have before this bumps into something. Hey, Tuco. You really want to play with that, don't you? But yeah, I can see what Ken's saying. And saying. we could consider maybe... So just to illustrate these design choices. So this is the option that I'm, I was more recently considering using to go, uh, using an array of these uh, distance sensors. Oh, and this cone here is kind of my uh, estimate of where these sensors are designed to be sensitive. So this is the one that goes between 80 and, or sorry, 10 and 80 centimeters. So there's a minimum distance, which is why I'm putting the sensors kind of at the top here. And then the gimbal goes down here. Center of gravity will be somewhat below where the, where the wires mount so that it'll keep it oriented upright. Um, and then I can also put the microcontroller in this stock, which would otherwise be dead space. Hey, Tuco. So with the depth camera, I was thinking I would have to put the camera kind of up over here, angle it down toward this area. 
so that I get kind of a one-sided view with some occlusion on that side, which would be all right. Um, and then maybe have to counterweight it on the other side with the Raspberry Pi, and that could get hairy fast. Um, with the rotating LiDAR that Ken's suggesting, that could either replace or augment this, perhaps. I'd probably still want this for close, you know, obstacles, but for, like, more distant navigation, perhaps that could go right here, kind of in this space that I've reserved for the USB connector right now. That's something to think about. You too, go. So, <clears throat> hey, Duke, you are right where I want to put this thing down. And then, as far as the mechanical design of the winch robot, that still needs some work. I have this thing here, which I'm not amazingly happy with, but I think it'll do for the moment. Not so much happy with it that I'm going to make more of these, but I think it'll do for testing firmware. So you can see, here's the spool. This rotates on a big old motor. There are a bunch of components here which route the nylon cord and pass it through sensors for distance traveled and force, and then it comes out the top. Um, the main thing I don't like about this is that it's, uh, well, I, I don't know. It, it, it couples any of the, so it's relying on the axis on the motor to be completely straight, which is not a good idea if this thing was made out of a completely rigid material. I mean, if this was metal, then, um, then that's how you get like broken bearings. Um, but as, as for this material goes, I, I was just ending up with some, some flex in the chassis, which I thought would be tolerable, but at first <laughs> it was just way too much. And then it turned out to be that motor had gotten, I think, damaged in shipping. The shaft was a little bit bent. So I swapped motors for one of the other ones that wasn't damaged in that package. And this one actually works pretty well, um, but it doesn't support that shaft as much as I'd like. So I don't know, I'm lukewarm on this design. It's definitely enough that we can get started writing firmware though. So this will be upcoming on a, on a stream soon. Just wanted to uh, display this briefly. So, and it's much safer to operate with this cover over all the, most of the rotating parts. Oh, again, suggesting using that LiDAR sensor and uh, mirrors to angle it downward. That sounds complicated. I've got these LiDAR sensors coming in for like $3.50 each, and embedding those in the case seems like a really easy solution. This is mostly obstacle avoidance, so I'm not really concerned about mapping at this point. I just want to make sure that this thing can react if it's about to bump into something or somebody. Okay, so with the... <laughs> you two go. Are you, are you done, Tuco? I think we can get started with the next part of the stream if Tuco is going to let us. So I'm going to put the Toby IX aside because this is what we uh, this is what we took a look. <laughs> I just wanted to first take a brief look at this cornucopia of eye trackers. Um, I ended up getting two of each because I was consistently frustrated with only having one of something I'm reverse engineering, but then I haven't even really opened this, the first IX tracker so far because the, well, we haven't gone super deep into it. And so, so far it's all been software and looking at the circuit boards. So maybe I could sell that one since I haven't done anything with it. But I have two of the four Cs since, you know, same, same rule, we're going to try not to have just one of the thing that we're taking apart. <laughs> we're gonna try not to have just one of the thing we're taking apart. Oh, here we go. Yeah. 
Yeah. Is that the shot I want or is that not in focus? I need to go. You're not eating plastic, are you? Oh, a question from Mikel in chat about what made me pick my current 3D printer. So that's a Type A Series 1. Um, I think it was pretty close between that and one of the Ultimakers when I was picking it. Um, they're pretty, pretty, I think they were pretty similar printers. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I'd seen the Type A's in operation somewhere around here and they... Um, or maybe online. I forget exactly where I saw them first, actually. Um, I think I just really liked the way the extruder was designed, and it seemed like, um, you know, I really liked how it could handle, uh, you know, a lot of different materials pretty easily. You know, I, I liked the lack of Bowden drive and the all-metal extruder and the wide build volume and that kind of thing. I mean, there, there are a lot of choices for 3D, 3D printers, especially nowadays. I think that was a little earlier in the in the whole availability of just lots and lots of different kinds of 3D printers that you see nowadays. All right, so let's put these aside. And we will put one of these aside as a backup. And so now we've just got Oh, and I can see that one of my lamps is off. That's much better. Are you gonna focus on any of these objects I give you, camera? Oh, actually, before I get too deep into this, there's a step I'm forgetting where I wanted to review what we did on the last stream really briefly, just to segue into this one properly. Um, and that was on this computer. <laughs> Camera, no, yeah. All right, so this is the video uh, from last time, we were looking at this Toby IX. It had this super, super pink packaging. And you can take a look at this. Uh, instead of actually playing this, I was just going to talk over the, uh, the time lapse really briefly. Uh, no. Ah. Uh. Okay, so um, this one started out with some good cat, didn't it? So this one actually started out as a, uh, so I, I, I heard about this project uh, because of Bill at AT Makers. Uh, he uses these devices uh, for making kind of DIY assistive technology devices actually. And one thing that's interesting, well, so let me back up here. So part of, part of what I, what I'm trying to do here in cooperation with Bill from AT Makers is to try to help hit this market, market, to try to help serve this, you know, group of people that seem really kind of underserved right now, which is people who need assistive technology and can't just come up with these huge sums of money for the, the kind of, um, you know, what would I even call these? It, you know, it, it's like you, you have to get funding for for the for most assistive technology devices. These things are, 
you know, you want a text-to-speech device and it's going to be over $1,000 easily when the, there's only, the only reason why you don't see technology like that for significantly cheaper is because of the current funding models. And so there's an opportunity out there for people who can, you know, repurpose existing technology to work around that limitation. You can, you can get something out there for people who don't currently have access to, uh, to eye tracking technology but need it. So this is stuff that's made by Toby for, for the gaming market. You know, it's designed to be inexpensive enough that you could kind of buy it as a computer peripheral and you don't need like insurance to pay for it, unlike the other trackers that can be thousands of dollars. Um, and so this particular one operates with the help of Windows software. And the Windows software takes images from an image sensor in the middle. You can see this, this little shiny disk in the center is the actual camera aperture with a filter over it. And then these three, uh, these three shiny lenses are actually infrared emitters. So we're taking a little bit of a look at the circuitry. And so they take in images from that camera and process them. We looked at a little bit of the image processing. That was the USB 3 flat flex cable I mentioned earlier. And so it was pretty interesting to take a look at this. Not necessarily the best place to start if you're looking to add eye tracking to something like a Raspberry Pi. Uh, we were still looking to see how possible that would be. It looks like the tracking software is actually pretty localized to just a couple of the binaries. So uh, this, uh, this tracking app actually included some audio that triggered the YouTube copyright bot when we first saw it. Um, yeah, we actually found that the, the tracking is localized to just a couple of binaries. The protocol seems to be not at all like a regular USB camera. It doesn't use USB video class. It's actually just using a bulk endpoint to send video frames. So it seems to be that they probably started with, you know, the USB video class example firmware from Cypress and then modified it to be something that's a camera with their own custom lighting and that doesn't actually look like, look like a camera to the operating system. And then their software actually consists of a whole network of little components. So there are components that just handle user interface and uh, controlling the Windows environment with your eyes. Uh, a lot of stuff written in C Sharp to handle that. Then it looks like some daemons written probably in C++ it looked like to actually handle the, uh, the eye tracking algorithms and the video drivers. And those were actually multiple pluggable components with basically a user space video driver in one process and a user space tracking algorithm in another process and a coordination daemon. And in fact, they use LibUSB even in their Windows software. It looks like the whole tracking engine was probably originally developed on Linux or just developed to be portable in general and then cross-compiled for Windows or you know recompiled in Visual C or whatever. Actually, I think even the Windows software was being compiled with GCC. I think we saw some traces of that. So anyway. And yeah, so this comes back to AT makers. So the, the goal here, besides potentially having an interesting teardown, and I'd really like to compare these two devices to see you know, what is the difference between them, what did they change in the evolution of the product, which is interesting to me as a, an electronics designer. But I'm also interested in looking at the different viability of these devices for DIY assistive technology. So the iX, for example, Looks like it might be useful if you're actually building something around, you know, a laptop or as, you know, not a Raspberry Pi, but something a little bit more powerful, preferably that can run Windows, but maybe with a lot of software work, we could run parts of their Windows software on something that's powerful enough that has a USB 3 host, like an Orange Pi. Um, or no, not an Orange Pi. Um, I keep getting these various USB boards mix, mixed up. There's one USB single board computer that I've seen so far with a USB 3 host, which is one of the Odroids. So that was going to be one of my candidates for getting the iX software running on there if we were going to try to get their x86 algorithms running through some kind of translator or something on ARM or just redo parts of it. But this is a new opportunity. 
this device probably implements all of that in hardware, and if so, then maybe we can just do a simple libUSB interface that we can run on a Raspberry Pi or whatever. So hopefully that provides some context. Oh, is there lots of pink? <laughs> oh, there was a lot of pink in the original packaging for the Toby IX camera. Uh, I, think, I think we might need to have a comparative packaging uh, experience as well. You can tell which one. This one is heavy, so this is the one that I've not gutted so far. This is about to reset itself. Oh. oh yeah, look at that pink. Yeah, this is really amazingly pink. I'm, I was going to say I'm not gonna take this out of the box, but I really just can't resist. Aw, look at how pink it is. <laughs> it's so pink. It just starts to look just more and more like chroma saturatingly ridiculous as you take this apart. So I'm going to put this back together. So, oh, this one's blue. The two genders of eye tracking. Toby Eye Tracker 4C. This one's definitely smaller. And they don't have the completely chroma saturated outside packaging, which I guess is nice. I, I'm gonna leave this in the box because it's really too painful to look at. Yeah, the packaging is nice. Oh, Tuco, you're gonna stand on my keyboard. You better not start Spotify. I think I unmapped those function keys again. I'd forgotten why I had those function keys unmapped and then Tuco, Tuco or my elbow or somebody always reminds me when I accidentally start playing Spotify on stream. Oh, I am not any good at keeping, keeping up with the cat. I think we need some kind of robot for tracking him. Oh, there's the chroma saturation. <laughs> Clearly they needed a stabilizer bar in that package. Wow. Yeah, this looks nice and small. It's got all this custom foam. Oh, geez. <laughs> the cable wraps around the foam. Is this a captive cable? Yeah, it's a captive cable, which is good and bad. It can take up less space. It's also not replaceable easily. But it should be USB 2. Yeah, USB 2 on the end. You can tell because it only has four pins. I was kind of expecting the little film stuff over the lens, but I don't see it actually. But they kept it pretty clean. It looks like this might be the same kind of magnetic mount on the back. This is a really nice piece of foam. This uses the pretty common technique where this looks like several die cut layers of different thicknesses that are all glued together. You see a lot of, a lot of different packaging made with this technique now. Looks like we have, ooh, <laughs> glue dots. There's just like the subtlest of glues holding that onto the page. Yeah, I'm playing with the packaging. It's telling you where you can stick it. 
I guess that might also be part of the captive cable thing. Like they didn't want, um, I imagine having a connector right there in your laptop would have both been a thickness challenge and would have been likely to get mangled by users. And we're supposed to go there again. And we've got these widgets. So these are just hunks of steel as far as I can tell with adhesive on the back. does have an orientation to it. Did I get that right? I think so. Oh, these are symmetric. Rare. And very strong magnet there. All right. Well, that all can go aside. There's no driver floppy disk or anything we need to worry about. So let's take this thing apart. On the other one, taking it apart was actually really annoying. Um, if I remember right, the actual housing was, I think, ultrasonically welded, and we had to use a heat gun to soften the adhesive on this front lens, go in that way. And we ended up taking the lens off in many pieces. It didn't end well for the lens. Nicely made piece of plastic. Oh, we found out last time that these ominous looking tick marks are actually part of an alignment tool. You align those with a visual indicator on the screen so that you can tell it where you put this in, rel in relation to the image. This gives it kind of the coarse calibration of where the thing is versus the screen. It does fine calibration just by asking you to look at things. Yeah, I don't see any other way in, so I think I'm going to assume this is the same as last time. Like, we took off the sticker last time and nothing was there. I think I'm just going to get the underclocked heat gun. back on the rack, and I didn't even notice. You are so photogenic, little tiger. All right, I'm looking for something to hold this with and a heat source. Same technique. So, Variac. And uh, heat gun.
just to try to avoid burning my, well, I'm not turning up the heat, but just to keep my desk from getting warm. Well, actually the desk will be fine and this might just be annoying to photograph. Eh. That is also very not parallel. This is attached the same way as the other one. I think they found something they liked and stuck with it. Oh, fine adjustment. some of that reflection, but now I'm reconsidering. Oh, that might be enough. Delightful. Deliciously warm. It smells like DC motor. Where'd you go go off to? like so far. We found this plastic to be very brittle last time. We've got the spudger under it, but it's still pretty stuck.
wrist cam. That footage is getting edited out. Plastic is definitely soft. I'd be surprised if this is flat when it comes off, but it seems to like returning to its shape, so maybe. Overheated that one spot. Remove this. <laughs> this seems effective. Don't you stick back down. So, make sure this doesn't re stick easily. Flexy little IR lens. Let's move that again. I feel like I could really easily just crack this last little bit off. I've been letting this part get very warm because that was originally shielded by the vise. I think there might also be some kind of additional Attachment, because that also seems to be a spot that was difficult on the other side. We'll see once we get this off. Or maybe there's just plastic right behind there that's acting as a good heat sink. <laughs> Boop. Try to let this cool 
off as flat as, as I can get it. That part is still warm, guess what? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I could probably heat up the other side and stick it to my table a little bit, but I don't really need to flatten that super much. That'll do. Good as new. <laughs> All right, put that one aside. All right. Whoa, that's loud. <laughs> Ken is asking if I use my mouse to flatten it. <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. This looks very different from before. Instead of, uh, well, actually, maybe that's the, the main difference. So before I was seeing, okay, we'll have a side by side comparison. Here's the other one. Oh, and Jared says it sounds like there are two gooder clients pinging at once. That's likely. Um, yeah, where would that even be running? It's probably on this machine. I don't know if that's two clients or just one client with some reverb on the audio because it's coming through the speakers here. Anyway, I don't think I'm going to stop that because then I don't think I'll hear the notifications at all. killing the Gitter client on my Windows machine. All right. I don't know if this will bring us down to no notifications or just a manageable, manageable number of notifications. So, just side-by-side -side comparison of the two. Oh, that's the notification. I wonder where that one's coming from. Where could that one be coming from? I thought we established that only the Mac, or only the Windows version of the Gitter client even knew how to do that. I mean, I have the copy of Gitter that's running in OBS, which could be making noise, but I haven't seen it do that. I don't think it knows how to do notifications through the web client. I don't have the app running on the Mac here. I do have the web. Is that coming through? Oh, yeah, that's, uh, no, I think it's the web browser on Mac. Maybe it supports notifications in Chrome. I'm gonna try it now. I think, I think I just fixed it maybe by killing the browser there. I'm 
I mean, I could like mute all the audio that comes from like all the PCs here. Oh no, that's it. Where is it? Ah. Is it still running on the Windows machine somehow? This is terrible. Oh, it is still running on this machine. Why is it not in the system tray? Go away, all of you. So, uh, I hope that does it. Otherwise, I have no idea where it's running. As far as I was aware, only the Windows version knew how to do that. Okay, I think that I think that might have fixed it. Great, thank you. Let's get a fresh audio file. Just Ableton always rolls over and loses my audio after the file gets big enough. And all I have to do is restart the recording every once in a while if I don't want that to happen. Hmm, okay, where were we? So comparing these two, um, this is the one we were looking at last time in the same orientation for continuity. Yeah, I'm gonna ping timeout. So in the IX, you can see a a camera, which I'm assuming is just an off-the-shelf image sensor with this baffle and infrared filter on top of it. Then these are infrared LEDs plus a cluster of four visible LEDs under a lens. And you can see in the middle one, it looks like they want to co-locate these two, but really it's that's as close as they're getting. And then over here, they want some spacing. And it looks like they're using a different approach on the on the new on the new model. So on the Toby 4C, the middle here actually just has the camera, and then immediately next to it you have these illuminators, which I think they're just relying on these being far enough behind the plane of the camera that they don't need that much extra baffling. But this looks like that is foam still. Then we have similar lens arrangements over here, which I suspect we're going to find big ol' IR blasters behind those. Oh, and is that another camera? I wonder if that is an ambient sensor. I just noticed that. Another aperture for something. So I was assuming that this would also lead the way into the rest of the enclosure, perhaps. There's all this adhesive, which we could peel off. If we just feel like Peeling. Who doesn't feel like peeling? Ew. Maybe I don't feel like peeling. Ugh. Meh. Duh. Okay, anyways, in um, plastic clips, maybe? There's something here along the sides. I don't know how much of a way in that is, but let's test it.
really tell what these clips are retaining. Uh, okay, that is holding this on. Great, I think we're on the right track. So I think the way in is you lift up the adhesive and then under the adhesive on the edges are these clips. I wonder if there's a way to get in without having to take off the adhesive if you just know where all these clips are. It seems like you need to have to push through that, but maybe you can go around it. I'm wondering if this whole assembly might have some other light baffles built into it since they're now just, I mean, having a big old injection molded piece that goes over the whole circuit board, it might be nice to build some light baffles into it. This doesn't seem to be releasing. Is this different? Are there screws on the back this time? Or just textured plastic. I Maybe mean, that's just textured plastic. No sticker there. Yeah, so that would probably make this the way in. Maybe I'll just start using slightly more forceful tools there. I think that's the motion. side up here. This is a pretty solid piece, but it's just sna snapped in in a lot of places. Huh. 
<laughs> oh, we got some Toby Silicon. Ooh, maybe, uh, maybe I should get some nitric acid on order. That's cool. So it looks like we might have two image sensors and a Toby ASIC. And it looks like just a buck converter, maybe. Let's definitely take a closer look at this under the microscope. great. I'm really curious what that ASIC would look like inside. I don't have the proper tools to take it apart here, unfortunately. So this, on the whole, I think was much easier to disassemble in that, I mean, they actually use screws to attach this to the back plate. They I don't know. We we could have a side by side once the video footage is up, but I like liked the experience of taking this one apart much more, but perhaps that's just the bias of having been here before. I mean in the other module this there are no screws holding the circuit board on. The circuit board just kind of fits into some uh, plastic uh, posts. Made the whole thing smaller this time around. I think these might be M2 bolts. So if this, I'm curious if that custom chip is handling the USB also. And I wonder if it has a bootloader, if it has a microcontroller. Those are all questions on my mind. Okay, can the captive cable come out right now? Because that might be handy. bonded to the back somehow. There's just a little bit of adhesive under there. I'm gonna try to get the other side evenly. Oh, I think that's a heat sink. You see that metal? Is this whole thing on a metal PCB? Oh, that's really nice. I don't think that's a metal PCB. I think it's a standard PCB, but they have uh, they have this heat sink or heat spreader that's cut to fit the PCB and some kind of thermal pad in between the two, it looks like. That looks really nice. Also looks pretty easy to integrate into other things since you could just stick it behind any old IR transparent surface, perhaps and have the heat sink built in. Anything else in this case? 
brass inserts. It's pretty nice. A lot of support in that plastic. I don't know if we got a good shot of these labels. Focus. All right, that's enough plastics. So, I think we should take a look at this under the microscope, but perhaps just a once over on the DSLR first, because this is just so pretty, these lenses. Oh, the lenses are all glued on. Oh, the two lenses are glued in. little puddle of glue at the bottom of each of those four pillars. So there's the input. Each of the LED emitters um, just seems to be a single LED this time. I think the red, the red LEDs in the IX were just for show. Um, I think only the IR would have been necessary, so I think this only has the IR. <laughs> Is that just the LED over here? I would assume that they would put the switching locally, but I don't see us, uh, any kind of transistor right next to the LED there. They might, uh, they might be driving the LEDs back over here. I was just noticing how those look like ferrite beads just for, I guess, the LED signal, like the actual drive current going directly to the LED. It's interesting. Lots of via stitching right there. So that's the sensor in the middle. I assume this is an IR lit, IR. Uh, IR pass visible light cut filter. I assume this might be just like a webcam. Like a auxiliary visible light camera. Let's get this under the microscope. This opportunity to make sure the, micro the microscope recorder is still operating. Normally my pole display tells me, but...
So that, um, that surface mount part labeled 502KH, I'm assuming that's some kind of transient suppression for the USB data lines. You might be able to see the differential pair in the middle, which would be the USB data pair going through that, which is typically what you do for keeping electrostatic discharge from the USB port away from the rest of the circuitry. Just the metal. So for each of these lenses, um, it looks like there's a hollow space that the LED fits into, and then that actually shines up onto this thing that is convex from the LED's perspective. A lot of reflections going on there. I think the LED die angles out right about there. And we can see something pretty much identical on each side of this, I think. So on the opposite side, a lot of heat stitching for heat sinking. Same lens arrangement, but pointing the other opposite direction. All right, beads. So if we go back to the connector side, Um, so that's the USB data on the top again. Uh, a bunch of ferrite beads. So you can see that little tiny common mode transformer just for taking the RF noise out of the USB data pair. And then ferrite beads for filtering all the power. So I think two of these would be for USB power and ground and two of them would be for that LED. And then over here, we're starting to see the power supply. I assume that... So I don't actually know what that 6H part is. That, that one labeled AAJ is definitely a switching controller. That 6H could be... It's hard to see where the other signals are going. But that might be some kind of, so it, I'm, I'm assuming it's not something high power because all the traces going to it are small. Um, it seems to be connected to the switching controller, so maybe it's some kind of reset controller. Maybe just some logic or something. Another small part, which could be a transistor or maybe some, some other random function. And then that, I'm assuming, is Oh, okay, that's actually the switching controller. E2310. I don't know what this is then. Oh, that's probably the MOSFET for turning the LED on and off. Yeah. And then the incoming power goes through that zero ohm resistor and the ground plane. I think the incoming power is going to be going through either the back or internal planes, and then LED on the top. Yeah, so this is gonna be ground, I think, because you actually have that coming up through the via. Well, not through, actually, just around, around the screw hole. So where does it actually come up? I don't see the vias. They might be doing via in pad on this board again. So it could be there are vias that we can't really see easily, like that little indentation. This might just be via stitched all around and then they filled the vias. So that might be what's going on for ground. And then presumably, maybe that, 
Okay, so this one is going right into the LED. This might, oh, this is the resistor for that LED? Huh. Maybe that resistor is unrelated. Anyway, let's move on. Some more, is that an oscillator? Tiny chip there. And that thing connected to it, um, is that a coil? That gray part in front, or is that like an oscillator? Or just a capacitor? I'm not sure what that part would be. And then that tiny, tiny flip chip in front, or in the middle, um, SMAA GHD. This looks like a linear regulator, just with the big capacitors. Um, that's probably just a really strange looking capacitor on the bottom. That's just a really weird service mount part. I don't know. Another BRW6QAD. Is that another FET? So that was an AAJ. Do we see another AAJ for the other LED over here? That is connected to something. That AAJ thing might be a dual FET. Is that the same one we saw on the last, the last Toby device? This is the IX. I think we decided these BRW parts were, were probably LED related FETs, but I don't remember for sure. Anyway, the kinds of parts I would expect to see are power supplies for all the digital functions, probably switching power supplies for the, you know, for the first couple of rails, and maybe another linear for lower voltage supplies. Um, anyway, this is the centerpiece right here. Toby iChip. Wow. So is that just taking USB directly? What else do we have on here? So we're going through power supply, power supply, or switcher, or something. Camera. Flash memory. Of course, I'm immediately curious, curious what's on that flash memory. So this looks like a pretty normal camera module, but it could really be anything. But I'm going to assume this is a visible light camera. And this is probably firmware for the Toby chip, but who knows? There's another little chip, a little flip chip thing with capacitors next to it. Maybe another voltage regulator. And then that big thing labeled D126K is probably the crystal for the Toby chip. Is that 12.6 megahertz maybe? And are we gonna see USB going into that chip? Man, more of these things that look like maybe regulators. Two of those. Oh, a linear tech DC converter of some sort or the LED driver maybe. I mean, that's definitely LED related. You can see that connected directly to this LED array. So this is the main camera. Less extensive baffle than on the previous camera, but still there's some foam around here to keep it from directly seeing the light from these LEDs. And it looks like there's a filter built into that lens maybe.
really curious what this thing looks like on the USB bus. Since I'm assuming their Toby chip must be a system on chip with a microcontroller and a USB core built in. So I wonder if we can program this chip. That might be fun. I wonder if it's got an 8051 in it. I would assume they would put an ARM in there, but I don't see an ARM logo. Yeah, I, I mean, I think I might plug it into USB next and see what it looks like over USB, but it could be really interesting to take a look at that flash chip and just spy on the bus and see what it's doing. Can we follow USB or did we lose track of that? Looks like it goes down into internal layers right where we hit this ferrite bead. This board is definitely still using via in pad. So that's just gonna go straight down and then across. And likewise, over here, I'm pretty sure that that is via in pad, so there are actually invisible vias stitching through the rim of this gold ring here. Neat. Any good candidates for USB coming in sideways, or you think they would come directly up from another layer? I don't see any components that they would need here. You assume that they would probably not need any serious termination right next to the chip. Yeah, let's maybe plug this in and see what it does. I want to plug this into the Mac first, just because I want to look at it in a USB prober. Recaptivate the captive cable. Hmm. Another USB extension, maybe. USB extension might be too long, but let's see if it works anyway. Open up my old friend, USB Prober. This is one of those tools like Shark that Apple deprecated even though it still does a bunch of things that their new tool doesn't do. Specifically, unlike IO Registry Explorer, this one actually shows you the, a view of the bus according to the USB spec. So it, it includes information that's useful for USB like uh, descriptors, including the entire configuration descriptor, which, as far as I can tell, IO, the IO, um, IO service tree doesn't actually include. Anyway, let's try plugging this in. chip. Well, that answers that. Got their own little boot interface. Adobe technology, they've got their own serial number in there. Version number one. Whoa. 
Something else on here is flaky. Let's turn off auto refresh. Hmm. Interesting. So this will, I, I suspect this will be pretty interesting on the USB analyzer. So without any firmware loading, because we don't have any other drivers or anything, it presumably is already booting up into some kind of fairly active looking mode. Like, I, this doesn't strike me as something that looks like a bootloader. It looks like this is doing its usual thing. So it might be loading a complete-ish firmware image off of that flash chip. So uh, I think what I'm going to do is let's install, let's get the USB analyzer running on this machine and the Windows software running on, uh, I guess we could try running it in a VM. Do I have a VM handy? Oh, my VMs here are kind of... Let's, let's install it on a physical machine. I think that'll be a little easier right now. So I'm going to use this delightful USB analyzer, Beagle 480. Wow, an eye chip. It's not every day you get to try to reverse engineer an eye chip. So, the USB analyzer has two ports. It has the USB analyzer device itself and the pass-through port. I'm going to plug the pass-through into the Windows machine. Since that's where I think we'll want to install their, their software so that it can hang out with the device. And you can get an idea of how it's supposed to work. And then the analyzer itself will go into this Mac so we can take a look at the trace. Their software will probably work better if this is actually in a location relative to the monitor that's relatively static. I'm just going to tape it up here. Alright, 
This will be similar to last time, except this time, USB analyzer. And, you know, different hardware that isn't USB 3 and should actually be doing tracking on the chip, which is all very exciting. Here's the USB analyzer. Plugging it in. <laughs> Looks like my USB hubs are doing some sleazy stuff up here, but I think the device is fine. USB little hub. Oh well, it's probably got a bunch of electrical noise. Can we filter that stuff out easily? Filtering in this program is so weird. Oh, let's just reset this and see how bad the errors are. Probably all right. Let's just try installing the drivers. I, the date, it, it looks like it's working. It's just, there's a bunch of noise that I, right now, don't remember how to filter out. Let's see if the Windows software is happy. where we were before. This is, so what is the URL they actually told us to go to? Kobe.com slash get started. I should make sure I have the audio muted on this computer. No, I didn't even press enter. How did you get there? Let's just mute this. I don't want to get a copyright bot problem. Oh, did they, is the software for this going to be the same as for the IX? 
I don't know if this is the same package I already downloaded, but this one says that it works with both. <laughs> Sound vol 32, thanks. I do command R, it, like everything defaults to the other monitor. Did I spell that wrong? I think that might be different in this version of Windows. So, I was assuming that this isn't already working because I didn't see any interesting traffic between the device and like the Toby software, so. What did I already install on here? This installed a bunch of stuff that was specific to IX. Like, I think the tracking core was part of it, but I'm gonna try just running this binary. It might be overlapping a lot with what I already installed, but... Oh, no, this is saying it's installed. Oh, well. What does Windows think about this device? Insufficient resources exist. What, what does this code even come from? This is just a Win USB device. It's, so the kernel doesn't really have much say in whether this works or not. Can I just try unplugging it and plugging it back in? This might just be related to my flaky hub. my analyzer saying and just try to find a more direct way of attaching this to the computer no hubs no hubs yeah okay fine let's try getting this there without any hubs which I think was the situation from last time I added this hub between the streams I mean between this stream and that one which was a little while ago I think this machine has a front panel USB port, which is right over here. It's like hugely in the way to have anything plugged into this, but it'll do for a quick test, I guess.
Okay, let's run this capture again. Let's see if this one's any better. Is this attached? This doesn't seem to be live yet. Try the back camera USB ports. Real time technical debugging. Did we find a working USB port? Huh. Can we just try plugging a mouse into that or something? Test. Are you there? <laughs> Curious what Mikkel's test was about. Oh, there we go. Okay. We have a mouse plugged in, which works. Can we USB analyze the mouse? Mouse works through the USB analyzer. Not seeing the mouse on the analyzer though. Maybe let's restart the analyzer. Maybe the analyzer has crashed. Maybe I did something the analyzer didn't like. Host disconnected. Sounds like the analyzer isn't connected to the Mac properly. Where is there a host disconnected? I must have missed that. Oh, was it saying host disconnected up here? That that usually means that the the host is the that's using USB terminology, so it usually means that the analyzer isn't connected to, like in that case, it would have been the Windows machine. But I think it was just the software getting confused. I'm getting a bunch of this noise, though. What are these orphaned knacks? And how do I filter these out? Anyway, there's my mouse traffic. I 
know what it thinks these orphan transfers are. This is an in. Is this just a device? Uh, like, I might have plugged it into a port on the motherboard that's actually also a built-in hub, and so we're seeing transfers for a different device. I don't know what that's actually about. Let's see if we can analyze the device we came here for. All right, recording. Let's plug in the Toby 4C device. There's a bunch of stuff. Cool. So there's the enumeration, set configuration. So it looks like a driver loaded. Let's see what Windows says about this. Still doesn't think it's happy about the i chip. Let's try getting Windows to uninstall the driver here. So for that, I'll uninstall this and then just replug the device. So now it's installing. The installing dialog went away. It still has the little unhappy symbol. I wonder if the Toby driver is already like can like partially bound to that other device that's no longer plugged in. We could try rebooting. I don't really want to reboot. I wonder if there's any Toby service we could restart. Oh, I think the process disappeared. I think ending the Toby service actually shut everything down pretty cleanly. And then without the service running, let me try doing that same thing where I uninstall this and then replug the device. We'll see if at least it loads without the, the yellow exclamation. No, it just goes right to yellow. That's interesting. Oh, I have two devices. There's a broken device and a working device. It looks like, or a broken device and a disabled device. Let's delete both of these. There's also the very heavyweight step of uninstalling your USB controller and then rebooting. Like not, not physically, just unloading the driver because it'll force all the child devices or drivers to also uninstall. What's up here in firmware? System firmware. <laughs> That's the UEFI driver. All right, let's replug. Yeah, there's sure are a bunch of old HID devices and stuff up here. Yeah, this just has one broken one. 
All right, I guess I'll reboot. I don't know what else to do. Oh geez, there's an update. Okay, well, if this isn't a quick one, we might have to pick this up later. Maybe we can take another look at the circuit board. It's tempting to just dump that SPI flash. So, it's USB interface. It had one interrupt interface, uh, I'm sorry, one interrupt endpoint. So interrupt N, in, sorry, interrupt in. And that's usually the kind of thing that you would use to notify when buttons are pressed or potentially maybe when frames are ready, something like that. Are we gonna have a black screen or Windows update? I had thought that Windows update was scheduled, but maybe black screen is actually what's on view now. also possible my HDMI setup has gone batty and oh it's probably displaying something on the other monitor which is more interesting Well, 30% complete. Well, I don't really want to wait for Windows updates on this stream. We might look at this under the microscope a little bit more, as much as is fun at least, and then... Um, oh, did the Windows machine just reboot? Well, maybe it's just teasing me, trying to see how long it can string me along. Good question from James, who asks, does it actually have any buttons? Not as far as I can tell, which is partly why it was weird to see the interrupt endpoint, but it's not uncommon to use interrupt for things like flow control. For example, um, you know, it could use the interrupt to just keep track of, like, how many frames it's completed so that you can, like, pull that separately, but it's less obvious what it would be using that for. So that, that'll also be interesting to see on the USB analyzer. And then it had two pairs of bulk endpoints, so two ins and two outs, which also seems like maybe more than it would need, but maybe one of those is like a command interface and one of them is like telemetry updates. Maybe one of them is images, maybe one of them is, I don't know. I can think of a few different things it might use them for. And I don't actually know what the outputs this device gives you are. I assume it would be something along the lines of eye gaze point, um, head position. So those are probably relative to the sensor in some coordinate system. And then I think this would be giving you a visible image based on what the optics look like. But we can see what the Windows software actually tries to do. That's interesting. When it was doing the Windows update, it only showed that on one monitor, but the BIOS just spams this to all the monitors that are attached. The metal backing on the PCB is pretty neat. It's tempting to play with that a little bit to see how it's attached, but... I don't really want to disrupt its thermal properties just yet on this one. Really nice little IR emitters there. No sign of those visible LEDs that we saw on the IX around its emitters. Pretty sure those were just for show. And this seems to be the actual LED driver chip. So this might be something like a constant current LED driver. 
and then maybe they switch its output between these different LED banks. Although with the number of LEDs here, it looks like maybe they provide more of a constant illumination from the center and then have, you know, then they maybe flash the sides to get highlights. And there's only one of those infrared chips on either side. Oh, and then how much flash are we dealing with? Let's look at this right side up. So there's the Toby chip again. So this thing has its own USB interface. It has its own firmware. Some kind of microcontroller core in there, presumably. No obvious, like, IP core logos or anything. It seems like they probably want to use something that they wouldn't have to pay a lot of royalties on. And then there is the flash memory, 25Q064. can look that one up later. When the computer isn't doing terrible things to its update process. Yeah, I didn't know there was an update pending on that machine. I thought I took care of that already. the same. I've been assuming these little things with all the capacitors nearby are linear regulators. There's a one labeled S E A B G N D C A B ground. They are similar, but not the same. Like They might be different voltages from the same regulator series. This mouse is in the way. RTAA SLD. Yeah, that strikes me as a family of linear regulators, all hanging out near their Toby chip. So aside from the power supply stuff, this seems to be pretty much a system on chip, which is Pretty impressive. So this is dealing with two cameras, their modulated lighting system, and a USB interface, and most importantly, all the algorithmic goodness that previously was taking like 10% of my PC's CPU power to do. Well, unless anyone has any burning questions, I think I might have to wrap up this stream until my Windows machine is healthier. And then we can come back for the protocol discussion after that point. Oh, geez, did my microscope grabber... <sighs> geez, how did that just happen? I think my recording's probably fine since that was happening elsewhere, but... Uh... my deck link just get really mad at me because it looks like the Tuco cam and the microscope just stopped grabbing. <sighs> okay, I'm having really bad operating system karma right now, so, and it looks like all of my video recorder, or maybe, hopefully not the recorders, we'll have to check the recordings and hopefully my footage is still good, but I think this is an omen that the stream needs to end. Sorry it had to be so abrupt. 
I would go to my cat cam, but the cat cam's all black screen right now. And the DSLR clock is stuck. So let's come back to this with less Windows updates. Hopefully the microscope footage was still fun for everyone. So yeah, sorry about the technical problems. I've seen that happen sometimes when the like some miscommunication between the the broadcasting software OBS and the the capture card happens. But yeah. All right, well, I will see you on the other side on the next stream. Looks like we'll need at least one more stream to get into this Toby thing. But it seems pretty interesting so far. Like there might be some firmware to dig into and like I'd be really into writing a Raspberry Pi driver for this thing perhaps. So happy hacking everyone. Catch you on the next stream.